Welcome to the last part of the TEM course, Spectroscopy. In this video, we'll focus on the X-ray spectroscopy. You may recall when we discussed the inelastic scattering in TEM, characteristic X-ray can be generated. You have the incident electron beam, which knocks out the core shell electron. This leaves behind a hole, and the electron at a higher energy level will jump in to fill the hole. The excess amount of energy is released as X-ray. Because the energy level for each shell of electrons is characteristic, the energy difference will also be characteristic. Thus, by looking at the energy of X-ray emitted, we can identify which elements we have in the material. Let's look at how the X-ray spectroscopy detectors detect X-ray. The detector is made of lithium-doped silicon. When X-ray hits the detector, it will generate a lot of electron hole pairs. There is an electrical bias applied across the detector. So electrons will be attracted in one direction and the holes will be attracted in another direction. This will generate electrical pulses and the detector knows there's X-ray hitting the detector. And higher X-ray energy will give rise to more electron hole pairs. This is how the detector measures the energy of X-ray. Bottom right of the slide shows a schematic of the X-ray spectroscopy detector. In older versions, you can see a duo of liquid nitrogen. Modern days, you will see electronic devices to cool down the detector instead of using the liquid nitrogen. There are two reasons to reduce the detector temperature. First, it will reduce the thermal excitation, so it will reduce the background noise. Second, there is lithium in silicon. At a lower temperature, it also reduces the diffusion of lithium, especially outward. There is one fun fact. The lithium-doped silicon detector is also called the silly detector. This slide shows you the setup of EDS acquisition in TEM. EDS stands for Energy Dispersive X-ray Spectroscopy. When the EDS detector is inserted, it's between the upper and the lower objective pole paces. Notice when the X-ray is generated from the inelastic scattering, they are emitted in all directions. The EDS detector can only capture a small proportion of the total amount of X-ray generated. Also, when doing EDS, it is important to know your relative position of the specimen to the detector. In the top right example, it is a wedge-shaped specimen. If the detector is placed about 10 o'clock to the specimen, then the absorption distance will be much shorter compared to when we have the EDS detector around 2 o'clock position. We try to reduce the absorption distance because a lot of artifacts can be associated with it. When doing EDS data collection, we usually tilt the specimen about 10 degrees or 15 degrees towards the EDS detector. Here, we'll explain why. Let's look at the specimen with zero degree tilt. We have the incident electron beam hitting the specimen, generating X-ray, and this is the absorption distance. Now, tilt the specimen towards the detector, and this is the new absorption distance, which is shorter than the previous case. Let's also look at some concepts and some rules of getting good EDS data. In TEM, we talk about spatial resolution. We try to achieve a good spatial resolution. In spectroscopy, we talk about the energy resolution. The energy resolution is usually defined as the full wave half maximum. For a regular EDS, the full wave half maximum for manganese K-alpha is about 140 eV. We will come back to this when we discuss the electron energy loss spectroscopy, EOS. When collecting EDS data, you always want good signal-to-noise ratio. There are a few strategies. The first is to increase the beam current. By increasing the beam current, you increase the events of inelastic scattering. The second strategy is to increase the acquisition time. Here's one good example from the textbook. When the acquisition time is 10 seconds, you don't really see the iron peak. When you increase the acquisition time to 60 seconds, you see a small peak. 
when you do acquisition at 600 seconds, you see a very prominent peak. The third strategy is to increase the thickness of the specimen. Remember, in high-res TEM, we want the specimen as thin as possible. But for EDS, we want the specimen more than one mean free path in thickness. Thicker sample will increase the chance of inelastic scattering. Thus, more counts on the characteristics X-ray. However, when you have a too good signal-to-noise ratio, it's not a good thing. You will run into a problem of dead time. It takes time for computer to process X-ray data. If the second X-ray hits the detector before the computer is able to finish processing the first signal, the second signal will be discarded. Therefore, if we have too many counts, then the signals will be too close together, and this will increase the dead time. Increased dead time leads to more artifacts. So what we want is a good balance of signal-to-noise ratio and the dead time. Usually, 20 to 50% dead time is acceptable. When acquiring EDS data, you can do point analysis, line scan, and EDS mapping. Point EDS is pretty straightforward. You just draw your beam on the feature of interest, then collect the EDS data. In the examples shown here, EDS spectra were acquired from these precipitates. The precipitate on the top is rich in iron, with a small amount of aluminum and chromium. The precipitate down the bottom is rich in iron and zirconium. There's also a small amount of titanium, chromium, and nickel. You can also do line EDS. I found the example online. The authors did a line EDS on the specimen as shown here. From the EDS spectra, you can see the chemical periodicity. You can also see where it is depleted with palladium, it's enriched with oxygen, nitrogen, maybe carbon, and boron. Last, not the least, is the EDS mapping. It gives you colorful and beautiful figures for your paper. From the example shown here, you can see the matrix is largely boron and carbon. The precipitates are largely aluminum and nitrogen. The presentation of the data is very straightforward. There are two types of EDS mapping. The first type is called digital imaging. Most of the old systems will do that. So after EDS mapping, it will just give you the colorful pictures without the raw data. The second type is called spectrum imaging, which has been recently adopted by many companies. What spectrum imaging does is at each pixel, it also saves the EDS spectrum so you have all the raw data. By now, I hope you have developed a good understanding on EDS. In the next video, we'll discuss the artifacts we may encounter when acquiring EDS results.